Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy Epiphany. There, yeah, 13th, 14th day of Christmas. I lost count. Um, glad to be back. Uh, certainly missed teaching this class. Two weeks seems like a long time, especially when it spans over the new year. But I pray that you had a blessed uh, Christmas and New Year and uh, looking forward to continuing uh, this study as we, uh, as we march into the new year here. So um, we are on session number eight, handout number eight, which um, thank you, Kathy, for walking around and passing those out. Does anyone still need a handout? Number eight? Is everyone caught up to speed? Okay, um, also I sometimes forget to mention this, but uh, there are attendant sheets on the tables in the room here. If you haven't signed in, if you could please sign in, that would be great, just so that we can get a count of people who are here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just a reminder, um, actually I'll, I'll just, take the opportunity to announce two things. You've probably heard these announcements, but they're important, so we'll just repeat them. Uh, Pastor Don, Wednesday nights, is starting a new study. Uh, it'll meet in here instead of in my office. He typically meets in my office, but um, anticipating some more people joining, so they're going to meet in the Family Life Center Wednesday nights at 630. Uh, it's a study called, um, or a program called Everyone His Witness. It's a evangelism um uh, focused study uh, from the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and it focuses on uh, how it is we can take our everyday opportunities that we have just to be Christ's witnesses. So uh, it's really something that we'd like uh, people to uh, consider and attend, and even if you don't normally come to that Wednesday night study, to join him for that. Uh, the second thing, and again, we'll announce this in the, again in the late service too, but uh, we do have a uh, call meeting as a congregation next Sunday after the late service. A light lunch will be uh, provided, and this is to consider who we might call as a director of family life ministry, and if the congregation so decides to call that person. So there are different places around the congregation, uh, around the church, where you can find information on the two people that the call committee will be presenting, the bulletin board outside of room 12, the binder that's been in the church office for some time now, as well as a board um, when you walk into the sanctuary from the narthex. So you can read about them in those three places. Um, their information can't leave the church. That's why they're permanently presented. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't want that information to leave the church, but, but take some time either today or sometime this week before that call meeting, uh, to read about them and to consider and to pray, uh, who God might be calling, uh, through our congregation, uh, to that position. So it's exciting. Looking forward to that. Um, any questions about that or anything else before we dive into our Bible study here? Okay. Uh, like I said, we're on handout number eight. We actually started this a little bit before the end of uh, last year, uh, talking about the messenger of the Lord. But uh, before we dive into that, let's open with a word of prayer. It is started. I actually was recording all of that so I wouldn't forget. I just didn't hear it. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence among us. We celebrated at Christmas uh, your presence come down to us from heaven in your Son, Jesus Christ, and thank you for sending a Savior. We celebrate this epiphany season, your presence revealed to the nations and revealed to us, knowing that we are your children. Thank you for these great gifts. Bless our new year. Uh, bless this uh, continued study of your word. And we ask for all of these blessings on account of, for the sake of, and then in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. 
All right, so like I said, we did take a look at um, this messenger of the Lord. We've talked about this a number of times, so we won't go through all of this again. But I did want it actually written down, a list of reasons why we consider when we encounter this phrase, angel of Yahweh, Malach Yahweh in Hebrew, and angel means messenger, uh, why we consider that very often the second person of the Trinity. Um, and so you'll see at least, you know, the eight reasons that I listed there. But primarily, again, just keep in mind that so often in the Old Testament, we see this person um, as the representative for God, but not only a representative, they are treated, they speak with the authority of, they act with the authority of God himself. And so we know that Jesus, the Son, is the one who, who makes God known. And so we see that angel of Yahweh, that angel of the Lord, uh, doing just that throughout the Old Testament. And we'll see some examples of that today. Um, any questions from last time about any of those uh, eight items that we discussed, why we consider so often that angel of Yahweh to be the second person of the Trinity? Okay, then let's dive into it today. We're going to start in, remember, we're looking at the presence, uh, the presence of the Messiah in the books Exodus through Deuteronomy. So that's why we're going to start at Exodus 23, verses 20 to 22. And um, let me just, before we read that, let me just see if there's any context I wanted to mention. Uh, this is... Okay, so this is um, the Israelites still at Mount Sinai and God talking about what they're going to do when they entered the promised land, the conquest of the land of Canaan. Uh, so who do we have to read? That? Ed, go right ahead. So Exodus 23, 20 to 22. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him. And listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. Okay. So God is describing this angel uh, of, of his that will be going before them in all of their journeys and all of the, the conquest. What key evidence here shows that the angel slash messenger leading Israel into Canaan is God himself from these verses? Okay, his name is in him. Yep, end of verse 21. My name is in him. That's a pretty clear indicator that this angel bears the name of God himself. What else? If you listen carefully to all he says and do everything mm -hmm. that I tell you. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the angel's voice and God's voice, God the Father, are, are essentially one and the same, right? And you would expect that, of course, with, the, um, with a messenger, that they're actually bringing uh, the, the word from uh, the the king in this case, the word from God faithfully. And then so the word that they bring is not their word, but God's word. But there's there's just this synonymous characteristic between the the this angel and God. And uh, we know that, uh, and this also plays into the role of the second person of the Trinity as the word. Remember the beginning of John's gospel, John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so Jesus is that word. Jesus is that word made manifest. Jesus is God's own voice, his message. He is the messenger and the message all wrapped up into one. What other evidence, Ed? Voice of God, 
speaks, it says, listen, this is my son whom I with, I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And he yeah. says, listen to almost the same word for word. Oh, listen to him. You know, I can't plan these things, even if I tried. Uh, yeah. So God out of heaven at the baptism of Jesus says, listen to him. Like what he says is important. And God makes no distinction between what Jesus says and what the father says, because they are one. Good. Anne Marie? Um, it says he will not forgive your rebellion. And I don't know if there's anywhere else where angels forgive or don't forgive. Yeah. So um, let's see. Yeah. So obey us. Do not rebel against him for he will not pardon your transgression if, if you rebel. Um, and, but in other words, he has the authority to either forgive or to withhold forgiveness. And you're right. Remember, that was the whole contention when Jesus spoke to the man who was paralyzed, right? He said, your sins are forgiven. And everyone says that's blasphemy because we all know only God can forgive sins. And that was the point because Jesus is God. Um, and so that's right. So an angel wouldn't have the authority to do that, but God has the authority to do that. So again, each time we, I, um, we take time to point all this out to see, we know we're not just making this up. There are so many indications that even from the, the context themselves, that the angel who was going before Israel into the promised land was indeed the second person of the Trinity, the angel of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh. We've discussed previously that the angel slash messenger of Yahweh and the glory of Yahweh are both manifestations of the pre-incarnate Christ. That was from our introduction time. Let's go back just a few chapters to Exodus 14. Exodus 14, 19 through 20. And Jack has that for us. Okay, please read Exodus 14, 19 through 20. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. Coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other. So neither went near the other all night long. Okay, so this is back uh, before, this is when the Israelites are crossing <clears throat> the Red Sea. And you have this angel of God who's already going before them. So this was the modus operandi for the angel of God, angel of Yahweh, who was leading Israel out of Egypt. And then when they get to the Red Sea, he moves. Where does he go? He went behind them. Why did he go behind them? Because Egypt's army was there. And so it was creating a barrier between Egypt's army and the Israelites to allow the Israelites time to cross the Red Sea. But there's also a synonymous thing. Like I said, we've talked about also this glory of the Lord, this cloud uh, by day, pillar of fire by night. What do you notice happens at the same time as both when one moves, what happens to the other? It says the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So are they moving together? Yes. Uh, we've indicated that it's Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, who is uh, present in that cloud that's leading them, that, that manifestation of God's glory. And remember in our introduction, we talked about when we say glory, it's talked about in the Old Testament as something visible. It's not something ethereal or intangible. It's a visible either cloud by day or fire by night. When we say glory, it's something that the Israelites saw and were assured of God's presence. And again, God's presence, which comes among us um, uh, with, the, with the Christ, with the Messiah, um, there's a key connection there. And so these aren't two distinct things, the angel and the the glory, the cloud. They are moving in tandem because we say they're both manifestations of the pre-incarnate Messiah. Questions about that? Okay. 
Okay, if not, we'll move on to the next one. Some really interesting things going on uh, in Exodus and elsewhere. So next we're going to move to Exodus 17. So now this is after the crossing of the Red Sea. This is pretty early on when they're in the wilderness. And Mike uh, is going to read Exodus 17, 1 through 7, please. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water. There was, but the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go out in front of the people, take some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribath because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Okay, thanks, Mike. So this is a pretty uh, pivotal moment in the history of Israel wandering in the wilderness. So how did God provide for his people through Moses? Yes, so Moses struck the rock, and according to God's word, which promised that water would come from it, it did. And again, this is not like a family vacation group that was thirsty. This was millions of people who were thirsty. So this was a significant amount of water that would have come from this. You know, some people say, oh, you know, there was the little trickle of stream that came out of a place and this was the headwaters or you know trying to make it seem more natural no this is a miracle this was god providing abundantly for his for his people now we aren't going to read it but this actually happens again you might think that there's another uh, very similar uh, sounding account in numbers 20 um and all i'll say about that in numbers 20 so they end up in the same situation, um, and uh, they're in the same place, and uh, God, again, uh, is going to provide for them, but he changes up the instructions a little bit. He tells Moses to take the staff and tell the rock, tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. And so you shall bring water out from the rock for them and give drink to the congregation, the cattle. And so Moses goes to the rock with his brother Aaron, and he's talking to the people. And did God tell him uh, to, to hit the rock this time? No, he just said, speak. But what does Moses do in Numbers 20? He hits it. And, and you kind of get the sense that it's, you know, he's just sick and tired of these people. Here they were in the same exact situation uh, same exact issue, and, and Moses actually does not obey God's command, but actually takes things into his own hands. And what were what was the consequence for Moses for doing that, for disobeying God? He didn't get to go into the promised land. And what I think kind of compounds that, and you know that seems kind of harsh to Moses, but I think there's a lot under the surface there. What compounds that is if you track all the times after that, after Numbers 20 of Moses talking about why uh, he isn't allowed into the promised land, he actually rarely comes close to admitting that it was his own fault. He actually usually blames the Israelites and saying, you know, you stubborn people, this is why I'm not being... So, you know, I think he's just, 
there's there these people in the Bible in biblical history they aren't perfect, right? And they and God often works through their imperfection, despite their imperfection, despite their sin, uh, for His great and and wondrous purposes. But anyway, that's just kind of an aside. Uh, but it's interesting that they end up in the same exact spot in nearly the same exact situation. Okay, but considering this miracle that takes place that we just read about in Exodus 17 of God providing water out of the rock, if you look at your handout, 1,400 years later, Jesus would be in Samaria talking to a woman at a well. So let's go into the New Testament for a moment and read John chapter 4, 7 through 14. And who's going to read that for us? Cindy's going to have that? Okay, so John... Chapter 4, I'm still getting there, uh, 7 through 14. Go ahead, please. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Thank you very much. So we're probably familiar with this. And of course, there's that um, just astounding interplay that Jesus is having with this a uh, woman in terms of talking about water that either quenches thirst or does not quench thirst and water that quenches eternal thirst versus water that does not quench eternal thirst. So let's just hang on to that for a moment. Let's go forward three more chapters to John 7. Uh, John 7, 37 through 39. So this is during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, and Jesus goes to Jerusalem for a, a feast, and um, something very interesting happens. Uh, so on, just to give you a little bit of background, during the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, in Jerusalem, they had this uh, large pool in Jerusalem that was, that was uh, uh fed through uh, springs and, and channels that were dug. And it's called the Pool of Siloam. They've actually excavated parts of it, and they found out that it was a lot bigger than we, we thought it was. It's pretty astounding. So if you're interested in archaeology and things like that, you can, you can find that out. On the last day of this, of this feast, usually feasts were about a week long, uh, the, te the, the priests would come down to the Pool of Siloam and with a pitcher... Uh, pick up the, the water uh, from the pool of Siloam, again, representing how that pool is, you know, God providing water to his people. It also provided water to the city when the city would be under siege. Because, you know, one of the things that is important in a siege is to have fresh water. Otherwise, the siege is successful. And the priests would take this water up to the temple and pour it out on the altar at the temple as a sacrifice as a way of, of honoring God and, and um, blessing him for the water that he provides. And it's on this day that Jesus stands up and says something kind of incredible. And so let's take a look at what he says. So who has, Vicki has that for us? Okay, so uh, John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said 
living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him, but the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Okay, thank you. So, John 4, John 7, what does Jesus offer both times? Living water. Rivers of living water. And it doesn't, he doesn't mean just water, right? In both situations, the people in those accounts were focused on normal water, you know, quenching physical thirst. Jesus takes both opportunities to point to himself and to the work of the Holy Spirit as providing living water uh, that will satisfy an eternal thirst. So how is this greater than the water that is provided in both Exodus 17 and Numbers 20? Never thirst again. Yeah, because did the Israelites get thirsty again after drinking that water in the, in the wilderness? Yeah, absolutely. But you see, they and, and they were amazing miracles. It's sort of like the feeding of the 5,000 or Moses providing manna in the wilderness. They are amazing miracles. And the point is that God does provide for our physical needs, water and food. But they are also pointing forward to something greater than that which they actually are. Primarily, I think, I don't, I, again, this is why we read John 4 and John 7. I don't think anyone who either heard Jesus that day or read John's gospel could think of anything else except for God's great provision of water throughout the people of uh, the history of the people of Israel and seeing how those events were pointing forward to something even more fantastic than those eternal water, rivers of living water. And that's what Jesus was leading the Samaritan woman to come to a realization of, that he has something more than just water to provide. And that's what, he, that's what Jesus is leading the people in the, in the festival of the tabernacles, the Feast of the Tabernacles, uh, and taking that opportunity where people are focused on physical water to point to something even greater, living water. Questions about that or comments? Mark? It goes right on to say this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Mm -hmm. And all of us who are baptized into Christ <laughs> uh, receive that uh, water along with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and our whole life is due. Yeah. Again, you couldn't uh, really have planned it better than to land on the uh, Sunday we celebrate the baptism of Jesus and give thanks for our own baptismal life. Because you're right, we receive these gifts through baptism. Uh, we have, we, you, are recipients of living water through Jesus. You believe in his name, as he says, whoever believes in me. And you have also received the gift of the Holy Spirit because Jesus has been glorified and the Holy Spirit has been given. Uh, what an amazing gift. <clears throat> okay, this gets um, even more interesting than it already has been. So we're going to stay in the New Testament and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the cloud and all went through the sea. They were all baptized as followers of Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from that spirited rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But God was not pleased with most of them, so they died in the desert. And these things happened as examples for us to stop us from wanting evil things as those people did. Okay, thank you. Well, the Apostle Paul is pretty clear. Who was the rock in the wilderness? Christ. Christ was. Now, 
he uses a lot of interesting language here. <clears throat> uh, verse 1, they were all under the cloud. Uh, the cloud of, of God's glory, remember, we said is a manifestation of the second person of the, the Trinity. So that's the presence of the Messiah right there. They passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. So again, we um, you know, First Peter talks about this, that, that uh, our baptism actually was foreshadowed by God's people uh, through the, the water, uh, through how God brought them through the water of both the Red Sea and also the Jordan River and even Noah and the flood. Uh, how that foreshadows our own baptism, how God has brought us safely through the water and given us life just like he gave uh, to his people. So that's what Paul is referring to, a baptism, um, that this was a foreshadowing of the baptism to come because they truly were God's people. They were also in God. And then he goes on to say, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. He's not saying that God didn't actually provide them physical food and physical drink. He did. But again, the point of that providing of the food wasn't just to fill their bellies another day, but to realize that God was there to provide so much more than just for their physical needs. It would be in God that they would have salvation, both physical salvation as well as spiritual salvation. So that's what he was saying, that God provided not only for their their daily bread kind of needs, but he was there as their God providing for all of their needs of both body and spirit. And he's very clearly referring to the time when God provided them water from the rock. But again, he's saying they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. So yes, he's alluding to the time when they drank from the physical rock and the rock was, was Christ, but also that they were drinking deeply from the, the pre-incarnate Messiah who was with them always, providing for all their needs of both body and soul. So there wasn't a physical rock that was kind of rolling around following them. That's not what he meant. But that, that rock that provided the water truly was a prefigurement of Christ, and that Christ was truly with them, providing for all of their needs as the Father had mercy on them through all of their wanderings. Um, so before I go on, any does that make sense? Any questions about that? Is that clear? Okay. So then he says, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, verse 5, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Why wasn't God pleased with them? What's that? They were disobedient. They did not obey his laws. They kept complaining. And, and it's not just like God got annoyed of complaining. What did the complaining indicate? A lack of faith and a lack of trust. That's the key. That's the heart of the issue. Is they did not trust God who was there every single day providing for all of their needs. So, what warning does Paul give the Corinthians and also us in verse 6? What does he say? Not to desire evil as they did. He says, these things took place as examples for us. We ought to heed and listen to and be warned that what the Israelites fell into should not be what we fall into, which is not just, you know, um, having a bad day or something like that, but a genuine lack of faith and trust. And, and he goes on to talk about the idolatry that the people of Israel so often fell into. And again, we fall into idolatry any time that we elevate something above God as something we love more than God, something we trust more than God, something we desire more than God, something that we fear more than God. Anything that we elevate to that kind of level is something we're turning into a lowercase g God. And, and that's what Paul is warning the Corinthians against, and that's what, of course, we are warned against as well. Now, did the Israelites face judgment for their sin? Yes, they did. What was their judgment? 
Yeah, so the ones who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb were allowed in. And of course, all throughout, their, this is a cycle that happens over and over again. God's judgment would come upon them, usually in the form of some kind of foreign oppression, a foreign army that won a victory against them. But did God give them entirely over to destruction? No, he constantly preserved them time and time again, even though they didn't deserve it, even though their sin earned their punishment. And God uh, was faithful to his promise, even to give them that promised land and to preserve a remnant of people in that promised land so that the ancient promise of a Messiah could come through them just as he said. Do you have something on that, Mark? Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, all of the times, because Moses is a leader and, and he tells the story. So he tells a story of, boy, they had this problem and this problem and this problem. There must have been some great days when all those people yeah. just simply praised God and yeah. loved one another and got along. And uh, there must have been those days also that that held them together. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Sometimes we can have just a purely negative or pessimistic view. and uh, But to think what it would be like to know and to see the presence of God with you on a daily basis and just to be led and, and comforted by that. So yeah, certainly there were uh, those good days as well. Well, how can we be certain that we won't face the same judgment as the Israelites did? Because Paul warns us to use them as an example so that we don't. But none of us are perfect. All of us are sinful. All of us do fall into a form of idolatry at one point or another that is trusting in something else besides God. How can we be certain that we won't face that same kind of judgment? And I ask you to think about Jesus' words from John 4 and John 7. What do you think? Gretchen? Jesus is our living water, and we have to have faith and trust in that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Trish? Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cindy and then Mike? He gives his living water free. Okay. Right. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? If you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink, you would ask him for a drink. So I'm going to go a little different direction here. But, okay, we can handle it. Hebrews talks about faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole key is a lot of times we base our faith on things that we can see and not things that we can't see. And that was that's what the Israelites kept failing, is they kept looking for what they could see, what they could not see. And I think in our lives, we can have momentary things where we our faith is weak because of certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. But we have to base our faith not only on Jesus, but on things unseen. That's the evidence of our faith. Yeah. Yeah, so two things there. We have a whole, this is why scripture is written and recorded for us, right? The living and active word of God so that the, the Holy Spirit can create faith within us uh, based on the whole history of God working throughout the history of the world for the salvation of his people. But you're right. Jesus says to Thomas after his resurrection, you have seen and believed. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. And he's talking about us. Um, but we, we have his word which assures us of the things we cannot see, but one day we'll see uh, when when faith becomes sight. And we look forward to that. Brenda, I saw your hand up earlier. I was just going to say that he gives us this living water, which is faith in the Holy Spirit. And we know that once we have faith, we will have eternal life. Yes. And I think the big thing is that, you know, he gives us eternal life. Right. Yeah. So it oh Bruce, go ahead. Verses uh, verses seven through eleven make it pretty clear there is no way out. 
of our sin predicament except through Jesus. Right. And it also goes on to talk about how well, you know, we won't be tempted beyond what we can bear, but we have to rely on him to guide and the Holy Spirit to guide us through those tempting times. Otherwise, we're doomed. Yep. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Pastor Don? How many times do we go and ask God for forgiveness and he doesn't give it? <laughs> Zero. Right. And it's interesting to me, uh, all we got to do is ask and the water pours out of the rock. Yep. We don't have to beat the rock or try to force God into forgiving us. Mm -hmm. All we got to do is ask and he freely gives. Right. The other comment in regard to uh, God getting upset with the grumbling and complaining, it's one thing, at least for me, to have my grandsons disobey me. It would be a totally different thing if they came to me and said, I cannot trust you. You are not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And I say that's over and over what we're doing to God, too, as long as, as the Israelites are, too. Yeah. And we take note that he provided for the Israelites, not because they were faithful, but because they were complaining. Um, that was sinful. And yet God was gracious toward them. And then think about the Jesus at the, um, at the well with the Samaritan woman. He was there because he knew that she needed him, that she had sin in her life, as we all do, and needed forgiveness. That's why he was there talking to her. So Jesus comes for sinners, uh, not for those who have their act put together and deserve it. Um, we don't have to, like Pastor Don was saying, we don't have to go to God offering sacrifices, hoping that uh, one of them will be successful and acceptable enough that he will forgive us. Um, God has said, I'll take care of the sacrifice. And he, that's why he gave Jesus. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. And that's why Jesus says, those who trust in me, who believe in me, who say that, uh, in other words, those who see that they don't actually need to bring anything of their own, but look to me for everything that they need, that will be sufficient for them to have rivers of living water. Water that will provide, a God that will provide for all of your physical needs, yes, but more than that, all of your spiritual needs. That's what all of this is about. That's what the Israelites lose sight of, and they would repent and receive his forgiveness. That's what we at times may lose sight of. I won't pretend like we don't. We're, we're fallible people, but we come back to God as Pastor Don said, and there are zero times that we ask for forgiveness and he does not forgive us. He always forgives. So we know that, yes, we're sinful. Yes, we need forgiveness. But God has taken our judgment away and instead placed it on Jesus uh, for him to bear to the cross so that we don't have to. That's why he came. Any other thoughts on that? Um, questions or things you're thinking about we say that he we haven't seen him but we have we have seen i have seen miracles and and they they were things that no one could explain mm -hmm. but i think the part that's hard for me and I'd like to think I'm not a complainer or a grumbler or, you know, <laughs> I think the thing that's hard for me is, I and I know he is the beginning and the ending, but when you see suffering and their babies suffering or people suffering that love the Lord, and, and I think that's the, that's the hard part. And I have to think sometimes, but, but Lord, here are these babies and, and really, a baby hasn't done anything. They haven't had time to. And I know that there's a plan. And I think what's hard is that I don't always have, I don't understand the plan. Right. And I guess I've come to the conclusion that w when you want me to know, Lord, I guess you want me to know. Right. <laughs> and and in the interim, I will just trust and obey and, and be his servant. Right. But I think that's the hard part for me is the suffering. It It is. Um and I would agree with you. In fact, you could, 
you could even go, I, I took a comparative religions, world religions class from a Christian perspective. And you could say that every religion in the world is attempting to answer that question. Why is there suffering and death? And they all come up with different answers or different things you have to do to avoid it. You know, um, Buddhism is all about believing that suffering and death are just kind of illusionary and not real. That's not the real essence of our being. And so the sooner you reach that enlightenment, the better you escape into sort of the spiritual nirvana type thing. You know, so th just as an example, that's a way that one religion tries to escape that idea of suffering. Christianity is the only religion that confesses lots of things about suffering. First of all, suffering and evil and death are all consequences of sin, our sin. That's not how God designed this world to be. And so while I agree with you, it's very difficult to see children or babies suffering. Even they are under the curse of the sin we all inherit from our parents, this original sin that gets passed down generation to generation and affects the whole world. And, um, and so they are sinful by nature, um, as we all are. And we suffer under the curse of sin and the effects that sin and death have in this life. But again, Christian, so the Christian is the only religion who acknowledges that, but also is the only religion that acknowledges that God has specifically done something about it that has entered creation himself as one of us to pay for, take care of, defeat our enemies of sin and suffering and death, so that while for a short time those things still occur, and we do at uh, you know on a personal level, uh, certain days have to say, I don't understand what this is for, but I trust that God does. Um, and we don't call suffering or evil good. It's not. It's not good but that God can even use suffering and evil for his good and gracious purposes. And the best example, and the only example that gives us confidence, uh, true confidence, <clears throat> is the cross. Because there, took, God took the ultimate suffering and, and death and evil, that is the Son of God dying on the cross, and turned it into the, the most good, the eternal good for the entire world, salvation for the entire world. And, and that's also what's unique about Christianity. We believe in a God, and this is profound, we believe in a God who suffers. That doesn't make sense in any other religion. Uh, but we know that that's what God chose to do for us in order to save us. So that now, as the Apostle Paul says, we, we also bear on our bodies, on our lives, the marks of his suffering. Following Christ means to suffer. That's what it means. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he's saying, take up an instrument used for the horrifying suffering and death and follow me. And while we can give thanks to God that we don't always have to be physically or spiritually suffering, uh, we know that he has taken away the ultimate source, the sting, the victory that suffering, sin, and death have over us by what Jesus accomplished so that, as we've been talking about, one day God is coming back to take all of that away. And when Jesus returns again, death will be defeated, Satan will be ultimately defeated, uh, sin will be defeated. They are defeated now, but there's a now and not yet component to our lives. We know they are defeated, and we are looking forward to the day when all that will be finally visible, fully visible in Jesus Christ when he returns again, and we will be raised from the dead. So until that day, um, yes, we do see very hard moments of suffering and death that we don't understand, uh, but we trust in those gracious promises that God has fulfilled for us and that we know we will see fully fulfilled when he comes again. Um, and that really sets Christianity apart from any other kind of hope or faith that we might have. Um, okay. Good discussion.
Any other comments or questions on that? Yeah. Um, again, other, just to tie up loose ends, other religions tell us either how to avoid suffering or death, how to get out of it, or what you have to do to get out of it, right? Here's what you have to do in your lifetime in order to earn it. But again, Christianity says, no, you can't, you don't have to look to Jesus who is the one who has defeated that for us. All right, so next week, we'll finish up this. We have a little, um, as you can see, we are coming back to Balaam's donkey, which is just always fun. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll do that next week. And then we'll move into the next uh, section of our study. Where we'll, we'll have finished Exodus through Deuteronomy, and we'll uh, begin um, uh, uh, hand, uh, session nine uh, next week. So let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for providing your Holy Spirit who gives us streams, rivers of living water flowing through our lives. We thank you that we will get to enjoy that life with you for eternity. And that is a sure and certain promise that we can always cling to. We ask that those uh, streams of rivers of living water that you have given us can flow through us as we reach out to others in our daily living, our day-to-day -day lives, this week. Lord, let your light shine through us for the sake of those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.